Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here, and this is week 12, which is chapter 11 of our text, and chapter 11 is called The Contested West. And if you think about the way the author laid this book out, it makes some sense. So uh, let's see, two chapters ago, he um, the, the author's spoke of the South and the Southern culture and the slave culture. So that was pretty clear. And then last week we went through the North and it talked about farming and opportunities and um, transportation and sort of invention and factories and all of that stuff. And so this week we move on to the West. So um, the West in this case is really, I think the book says, you know, the old Southwest and the old Northwest. And what they mean by the Old Northwest is basically like the Midwest and the Great Wake Lakes, Great Lakes region, and the Southwest, pretty much Kentucky, Tennessee, down that way. Um, but but really, getting west of the Mississippi River, that's the West we're going to talk about in this chapter. And I, I think um, it's extremely important. I, the biggest point out of this chapter, I guess, to sort of set up the rest of the semester is this idea that uh, should slavery expand west or not. And it's not really addressed that much in this chapter, but the one thing in this chapter that you'll read about is Texas, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And this idea, should there be slaves in Texas or not, is already a contentious issue. And so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you go through this chapter. And then as we move forward, to uh, chapters 12 and 13, I think we get into that a little bit more. But but this idea of westward expansion and how it affects uh, slavery in the U.S. moving forward is something important to keep in mind. But that having been said, there's also a lot of other cultural stuff to keep in mind and, and quite a bit of what I'll call ugly history in this chapter as far as uh, Native Americans and Tejanos um, and others that were living in the West go. And that sets us up nicely for the intro to the chapter. So the whole point with the intro is that between the years of 1820 and 1850, the uh, percentage of the total population of um, Anglo North America was west of the Appalachian Mountains. So like, you know, where we live, well, I don't know where you live, but where I live right now in Ohio um, or the Midwest or the Great Lakes region, all the way over to, you know, Pittsburgh and a little farther east than that, that whole area is west of the mountains and uh, 50%, more than 50% of the population lived west of the Appalachians um, by uh, 1860. And so, that was a huge increase from 1820, for example, where like only 20% of the population lived on the other side. So so the whole point is that there's vast expansion as a population grows, mainly through immigration, there's this big drive to move west. And, and that sets us up for, um, you know, the rest of the chapter. So the like the first section is called the West in the American Imagination. And um, what that means is that there were a lot of promises made to settlers and immigrants that, uh, hey, you can move west, you can buy really cheap land, and you can start your own farm, you can do your own thing, and it's going to be great. You know, that was the imagination, that it was this idealistic area where you could just go clear the land with an axe, uh, build a cabin, and start farming, and everything would be cool. And that's that's the way that the West was portrayed, like in paintings of the day and uh, perhaps in newspapers and media of the day. Well, only newspapers. It's the only media of the day. Uh, but this idea of this uh, opportunity moving West. And so a lot of people moved West to seek fortunes, uh, not only maybe in farming because the land was cheap, but also there were opportunities for mining and lumbering. So um, there were a lot of opportunities that... Uh, and they were real opportunities in some cases. There were a lot of opportunities that uh, convinced a large number of people to move west. And and it's it's funny if you go back and look at the advertisements. So uh, railroads, which weren't crossing the country yet, because this takes place in this chapter, 1820 to 1860 or so, and we wouldn't have the Transcontinental Railroad until 1869. But but railroads that went as far as Chicago, for example, which was the far west at one time, um, or steamship companies or other speculators who bought land out west, they would advertise opportunities even over in Europe. 
So, you know, Germans and um, not too many from France, but but a lot of Germans uh, immigrated to the U.S. during this period of time. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons was is because they would read these articles or see these posters um, for, you know, opportunities in, in, you know, the Western United States. So so you had a lot of people trying to go out and make their fortune out West and not not um, much different than the uh, fracking and shale oil boom where a lot of people, even uh, students from the University of Toledo that I had in my class, uh, you know, would, would move out to the Dakotas to get jobs in the oil fields, which they really did. So it's, a, it's the same kind of thing, this idea that, hey, I'm going to move out and, and get rich. And, and so there was a grand mix of people that moved out. So there were families, there were church groups, there were um, single men, there were, um, uh, you know, organized ethnicities <laughs> moving out, like all the communities were going to move out, or organized religions. So certainly when we talk about the Mormons, um, you know, the Mormons went, you know, from, um, um, you know, from Illinois, basically, while well, they actually went from all the way east to Kirtland, Ohio, and then to Illinois, but, you know, eventually settle in Salt Lake City. So that's an example of like a religious movement or a cult, if you will, uh, moving, uh, moving west. So the point is that uh, the West was idealized, and and many people moved out there for opportunity, whether it was religious opportunity or opportunity to make money, and and so that's all well and good. But you know the the issue with that is that the Native Americans, which you know the Anglo Americans, the White Americans, has had basically driven you know to Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Iowa and all those places. Now all of a sudden they were in the way again. So. Um, that was that was going to be an issue, uh, which we'll address. So there's that, and and the other thing is that, um, you know, clearing the land to build a farm is very difficult. So um, there's there's um, a little thing about Cyrus McCormick in the Mind Tap. There's a video that talks about McCormick, and he of course invented the Reaper, which made um, harvesting crops, you know, wheat, like a ton easier. So like one guy with a reaper could do the work of 25 men in the past. So, so there's a little video in mind tap. You should watch that. But, uh, the point is that there were these advancements in farming. So sort of an agricultural revolution, if you will. And these adva- advancements in farming made it easier for some of the farmers who moved West to um, uh, plant and harvest crops, and so therefore making it more profitable. And and we, we can talk more about farming in the West here in a minute, but but um, so S- Cyrus McCormick was a big deal. And, and so not only did the invention of new uh, agricultural technologies um, uh, enhance or speed up movement to the West, but it also sped up this idea that not as many people were needed on farms. So there was uh, less labor necessary on farms because of mechanization. So a lot of a lot of people that would normally have stayed in rural areas, you know, moved to the cities. So there's this beginning of urbanization in the country that happens, um, you know, in the late 1800s for sure after the Civil War, but it's beginning already before the Civil War, which is a time frame we're talking about. And you know, there's other stuff going on. The gold rush of 1849 in California, and I think we get into that a little bit more in the future. But you know. The point is, a bunch of people are moving out west and all seeking their fortunes. So, <clears throat> as far as um, you know, the, the area of what would be today um, Iowa and Nebraska and Kansas and eastern Colorado, if you're kind of familiar with that area, um, that's where a lot of these homesteaders were moving. As far as the north northern part goes. And then um, in the south, in the old Louisiana Territory, uh, certainly in Texas, and we'll talk about Texas in a little bit, you had a lot of people moving in that direction. And the people in the south, of course, were hoping that you know they could take their slaves with them and start, start new farms. Not so much tobacco because of the semi-arid um, in the southwest, but certainly cotton and short staple cotton, which is a certain uh, strain or variety, grows really well throughout that whole region. Uh, which would be like um, uh, Arkansas and uh, Alabama and western Georgia and out that way to Texas. So um, again, north or south, people are moving west. And, um, you know, there's a lot of Indian resistance. And um, there's also the Texas issue, which is really a fascinating story. So, um, 
you know, before 1848, uh, Mexico uh, had had uh, Texas for sure. That was all their property. And then they had uh, what's today Arizona, New Mexico, all of California, most of Utah, most of Colorado. I'm probably forgetting Nevada. I don't know if I mentioned it. But a bunch of those states out west were Mexican. They didn't belong to the United States back then, including California. So um, Texas was an area that was a state of Mexico, but had gained some autonomy over the years. I think in, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the year, but in the 1820, 1824, um, this, this um, state, if you will, this area of Texas, which is mostly populated by Tejanos, which are Spanish, uh, Spanish Mexican or Spanish Native American mix. And um, they're, they're autonomous. And, and what happens is that the Mexican government starts to encourage United States, um, you know, farmers, if you will, or American farmers to move to Texas because Mexico wants Texas to be developed. And the reason for that is, is because the Comanche Empire is in the U.S. at that time, like around Oklahoma and southern Kansas uh, and, and, and what is today Texas. The Comanche Empire is a huge Native American empire, which is, is raiding Mexico all the time. So the idea for the Mexican government is we're going to we're going to get a bunch of people from uh, the U.S., a bunch of American farmers. We're not going to let them have slaves, but we're going to give them cheap land deals in Texas. We're going to get all of these white people to move to Texas, and that's going to provide a buffer between us and the Comanches so the Comanches can raid uh, the white guys for a while, basically. So that was their plan, but um, and it went really well because a whole bunch of people from um, the U.S. move to Texas because of you know cheap land and big land. There were land grants. They would basically be giving away land. And, and so a, a bunch of Americans moved to Texas, uh, some of them with slaves, which Mexico didn't like because slavery was illegal in Mexico at the time. And eventually what happens is the Americans um, rise up and uh, declare their independence from Mexico in this state called Texas. So you'll see uh, names like Sam Houston. So he was one of them. Davy Crockett. There really was a Davy Crockett. And um, um, so so those are sort of the leaders. Stephen Austin, of course, who is uh, the son of Hiram Austin, who who dies, but starts this with the Mexican government that, hey, you should you should give land away. So the city of Austin, Texas is named after Austin's and Sam Houston has Houston named after him. And so that stuff really happened. But the point was that, um, you know, uh, Texas became this independent country called the Lone Star Republic in, I think, eight, uh, the end of 1836. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. And Texas becomes independent. They have their own constitution. It, it legalizes slavery and makes being free and black in Texas illegal. So that's all part of their constitution in 1836. So a lot of that is going on. And then also in this section of the book, which is 11.4, I think, um, you'll read the phrase manifest destiny for the first time. And it probably doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but, but uh, manifest destiny is just a term, a phrase that um, was coined by a guy named John O'Sullivan. He was basically a writer and um, he, and I have a link in the reading notes, there's a link to his original article. So in his original article, his article is all about the fact that um, um, you know, the, the Anglo-Americans, the white people should be able to move all the way west. It was their destiny to, to take all the land between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean because, you know, they were a superior race and that they were going to do these cultural improvements. So uh, this idea that O'Sullivan came up with, even though it's just a phrase, you know, it's like a build the wall type phrase, um, you know, that really stuck with a lot of people. And for a lot of Anglo-Americans, they felt like, you know, they were ordained by God. And that is in O'Sullivan's article. If you read the whole thing, cool, you, you should, or at least read the first two pages. But, but basically he's saying, you know, it's, it's providential. It's, it's deemed by God that the Anglo-Americans are meant to go, you know, from sea to shining sea, if you will. So um, it's, it's important to know because I think this idea of manifest destiny, 
you know, it even took us to Hawaii, you know, in, in, in the late 1800s. And, um, you know, I think that that's um, a rich part of the history, not a pretty part, but we should at least understand the reason why. And, and what we can get out of it is the power of a phrase that basically someone makes up, but, you know, you get people to believe in it and it, it moves forward. So there's that part, but know what Manifest Destiny is. I mean, we don't have a quiz this week, but if you don't take anything else away from the class, you should definitely do that. And if you read through my highlights and my notes in the textbook, there's, there's a lot of ugly history in there. So I talk about that stuff and, um, you know, take it to heart. I'm going to talk about one in a minute. So um, the last part of the chapter is called Cultural Frontiers in the Far West. And um, it talks about people migrating out west, you know, on foot or, you know, on horse drawn, you know, wagons, the horse and buggy thing. And, the, the, you know, the Conestoga wagon, the, the classic, uh, out, you know, out west wagon. And as someone who has driven, I've driven across the country probably, I don't know, a dozen times in my life, maybe more, maybe less. But it is a long way, even by car. So, I mean, I spent time in Colorado and, and um, you know, California and Utah and Nevada, and, and it is a long way. So uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to drive west, uh, please do so, you know, when you, whenever you can. If you have a car and a little bit of money, go, because it's cool to see the country. But, but you can appreciate how long the trip is. So when you read about, um, you know, these families going out west to seek their fortune, it is a long way and there is virtually nothing uh, out there. I mean, you know, so yeah, gas stations, but uh, there is back then there was absolutely nothing out there. And the weather is totally unpredictable. It can be 100 degrees one day and 30 degrees the next day. So um, it's something to appreciate if, if you've been out. It's almost unimaginable. So uh, the last chapter of the book, again, Cultural Frontiers, talks about people going out and how, how, how long it is. And it talks about the Catholic missionaries in the, I think today, the what, Oregon, that area. But it just kind of gives you some background of who was out there. A lot of these Catholic missions and missionaries were, were not great people, truly. They're trying to convert the Native Americans, but you know they enslaved them at the same time in some ways. And then, of course, you'll read about the Mormons uh, you know, traveling out to Salt Lake City which is amazing. I mean, you should see Salt Lake City. And but there's all this ridiculous stuff too. So read about the Mormon cow incident because it's ridiculous and I think, you know, of all the things we we learn about, what comes up time and time again is that um, you know, something in history gets out of control and the next thing you know, a lot of people get hurt. So the Mormon cow incident is one of these things where um, um, a Mormon settlement is passing through on their way out west and a Native American uh, accidentally kills a Mormon cow who strays away from the herd. And uh, the Native Americans even go to the Mormons and they like offer to trade a horse and some other stuff as compensation for this cow. But the, um, the Americans won't hear of it. And next thing you know, there's a gunfight. And I think originally like 36 people die. And then, um, and, and then the Americans are upset. So they go raid the village and, you know, a, a, a month or two after and like kill everybody. And, you know, it's this ugly stuff that we see all time and again, like over a cow, you know, over, you know, 300 people are killed. So, you know, read through that because it's, it's interesting to note all the mistakes that we make in history. Um, and then the rest of that chapter, it just closes out with like ecological uh, consequences. So I always think of like the wiping out of the bison as a, a consequence. And, um, you know, again, if you if you go out west, um, you know, I, I've seen bison at Yellowstone National Park. But even today, you know, people there's big signs like don't approach the bison and, you know, you know, tourists get out of their cars and they walk right up next to the bison. So people are just crazy. But back then, uh, you know, the bison and the buffalo were wiped out not only by Anglo-Americans, but also by Native Americans because, you know, they converted to this trading society to trade with Anglo-Americans. And a lot of the things they wanted to trade or they wanted were buffalo hide. So there was a, a convergence, the perfect storm as far as wiping out the bison. And then, of course, uh, the gold rush of 1849. So um, there was a guy, he actually was a, a leather a tanner, okay, a guy who processed leather named John Sutter. And he had a farm out there uh, near Sacramento, California, which 
is in the northern part of the state, sort of um, in line with San Francisco. Like if you're in San Francisco and you look towards Ohio, you would look through Sacramento, so it's up there. And um, um, there's uh, he discovers someone discovers gold on John Sutter's place. And so now here's another, you know, it's a gold rush. Everyone's like, oh, we're going to move out west and, and find our fortunes. And a, and a few people find gold, but, but most didn't. But what it did was it drove this population boom to California. And after 1848, the U.S. had possession of California anyway, after the uh, Mexican-American War. So, um, and I think that's covered in Chapter 12. It's kind of backwards here. But, but understand that California, after California, is, is uh, a possession of the U.S. is is annexed. Um, the next year is this gold rush where everyone you know runs out there, and there'll be another gold rush in the late 1800s in Alaska. But you won't be with me in the class for that part. Um, so that's the gold rush, and then finally, there's a nice little article in the textbook about the Mexican-U.S. border, which was a problem then and is a problem now. And what I like about the text is that it's current. It goes all the way up to um, Donald Trump's, you know, promises to build the wall. And it has this critical thinking question about, you know, what would you do? And you don't have to answer it, but it's something to think about. So I think it's a good article and it helps us uh, put in context, you know, what's going on in the news today. So there's that. I hope you enjoy the chapter. Again, there's not an assignment this week, but I mean, there can be some questions about this on the next assignment. And uh, it's it's a fairly easy read. So um, just understand that, you know, we're setting up for a, um, a, a battle as far as what happens in the West, as far as slavery is concerned, free states, slave states. So we'll get to all that. But uh, that's where we're at. So have a great week. I hope everyone's doing well. If you have any questions, let me know. Take care. Be safe. Bye-bye.